Now this morning I want to begin a short series entitled Possessing Your Inheritance. And as you turn to Joshua chapter 13, we're going to read there in a moment, you will see highlighted the phrase, God speaks to Joshua and says, there remains very much land yet to be possessed. Joshua chapter 13, I'm going to read verses 1 through 7. I want to say that in the middle, we have a long list of names of places, the parts of Canaan that were not yet conquered and inherited by the children of Israel. These names are difficult to pronounce. They're very obscure. You won't find, find them on a map today, and even some of your Bible study maps might be hard pushed to find them. But uh, it's just a long list of what remains to be done. And as you listen to those names, think about the things that, um, I don't want to spoil your Sunday, but think about the things that uh, are not yet completed, projects unfulfilled in your own life and in your own ministry. So Joshua chapter 13. Now Joshua was old advanced in years. And the Lord said to him, you are old, advanced in years, and there remains very much land yet to be possessed. This is the land that yet remains. All the territory of the Philistines and that of the Geshurites from Sihor, which is east of Egypt, as far as the border of Ekron northward, which is counted as Canaanite, The five lords of the Philistines, the Gezites, the Ashtodites, the Ashkelonites, the Gittites, the Ekronites, and the Avites. From the south, all the land of the Canaanites, and Mira, that belongs to the Sidonians, as far as Aphek, to the border of the Amorites. The land of the Gebelites, and all Lebanon, towards the sunrise. From Baal Gad, below Mount Hermon, as far as the entrance to Hamat. All the inhabitants of the mountains from Lebanon, as far as the brook Misrephoth, and all the Sidonians, them I will drive out from before the children of Israel, only apportion it, divide it by lot, to Israel as an inheritance as I have commanded you. Now therefore, divide this land as an inheritance to the nine tribes and half the tribe of Manasseh. There remains very much land yet to be possessed. Jim Lovell Jr. was the commander of an infamous Apollo mission, Apollo 13. Now, if you know the story of Apollo 13, it's it suffered a critical failure on the way to the moon, and it was only brought back safely to Earth by the efforts of the crew and the mission control. And I wonder if uh, Lovell, as he reflects on this, uh, this was the background to the statement that he makes in one of his publications. There are people who make things happen, there are people who watch things happen, and there are people who wonder what happened. Then it goes on to say, to be successful, you need to be a person who makes things happen. What happened? I guess, as we know from media recently, in the last few days following the general election, a lot of people are asking, what happened? None of the pundits, the pollsters, or political commentators were expecting. It took, it, took them by surprise. Somehow, someone, somewhere, lost the plot didn't really understand what was going on in the nation. Any time you lose the plot, it can be quite frustrating if you're watching a television series or coming halfway through a movie and you have no idea, you ask, what's, what's going on? What's happening? Losing the plot. But I think even more tragic, most tragic of all, in fact, is when we lose the plot for our lives. When we live the whole of our lives from day to day, not ever discovering what life is all about. In our passage today, we have a story 
taken from the Israelites as they are trying to make full possession of their inheritance. And it reminds me that they came out of Egypt for a purpose. Moses' ministry was to take them out, but God's purpose was not just to take them out of Egypt, but to bring them into something, the land of Canaan, which God described as a wonderful land flowing with milk and honey. Coming out of Egypt is a picture of our salvation. Before we were in bondage to sin, to the hard, hard task make, maker of sin, task master of sin, we were struggling under the oppression of the rule and dominion of sin and Satan and death. And there was no good news at all, but Moses rescued them. And on that final plague that hit Egypt, the plague of the firstborn, God said, I will protect you. Make sure that you sacrifice a lamb and sprinkle the blood of the lamb over the doorposts and lintels of your homes. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the judgment that is to fall will not touch you because you are protected by the blood. That's exactly what it means to be saved. It's a picture of our salvation. The blood of Jesus, God's sacrificial lamb, has paid the price for our sins and carried our judgment so that when by faith we apply the blood of Jesus to our lives, in other words, when we say we put our trust in what Jesus did, we put all our trust in this one thing, Jesus died for me. Simply by faith, when we accept that, we are saved, we are delivered, and we're set free, given an assurance of God's free gift of heaven. It's that simple. We are saved by faith and by faith alone. But that's not the end of the story because God says, I have saved you for a purpose. And now when we look at the children of Israel as they are occupying Canaan, it's a picture not of our salvation, but of our inheritance. The life that God has for us and an inheritance that comes into play. And this is not by faith alone. You can believe as much as you like for your inheritance and it will not come to you until you put your faith into action. Put your faith into practice. And so the works done in faith are the very things that cause you to rise up, lay hold of your inheritance and everything that God has for you. Coming out of Egypt in order to take possession of your inheritance in the promised land. It's a picture of the Christian life. Now, have you ever wondered why God, the moment you are saved, doesn't immediately take you to heaven? If that was the case, there would be no believers in this place. It wouldn't even be a believing preacher. We'd all be gone. Who would preach to the rest of them? And uh, when at the end of the service, when I make an appeal for salvation, this won't happen to you. But suppose it did. When God says, okay, the moment you accept Christ in your life and you are qualified for heaven, you're coming home. It would be, yes, I see that hand. Bang. No, I don't anymore. They're gone. Have you ever wondered why God does not immediately take you to heaven the moment you believe? Well, it's very clear. God has a plan and purpose for your life on earth, before heaven. The Bible says that God has prepared good works for all of us. He's prepared them in advance, and, and our inheritance is to lay hold of everything that God had in his mind when he laid hold of us. Paul in Ephesians 2 verse 20 explains this quite clearly. Ephesians 2 verse 10, he explains it very clearly. For we are his workmanship. That's a very rich word, workmanship. In other words, it's the word actually where we get the English word poem from. It means creative masterpiece, God's creative craftsmanship. And he has taken so much care, recreative care, to remake us according to his original plan. So it says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ for good works. In other words, there's a purpose. 
He shaped our lives, remade our lives for a purpose. The Bible describes it as good works. And of course, it, it means acts of charity and serving in the community and doing all the good deeds which Jesus calls us to do. But it's not just about that. It's about everything that God has for us as we live out our Christian lives before we go to heaven. These good works, the Bible says, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. He ain't going to do it for us. Your pastor, your brother, your sister, your cell leader, your cell member, it's not going to do it for you. You have a call upon your life that God wants to rise you to rise up and take it. Being involved in his purpose for your life is moving towards your inheritance. And this is part of a big plan. It's not just about you. In fact, it's all about Jesus. And the remarkable thing is, is that we are part of that story and your story and my story are brought into the bigger story, the greatest story of God. God's big story is a love story in which he chooses to display his glory in all the earth before the very powers of heaven through you, through your life, through my life. And the end goal is to have an innumerable company of redeemed people, people redeemed by his grace, carrying the image of Christ in glorious relationship with God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and all of God's people. And it doesn't just end there. It actually ends in a whole new heaven and a new earth, which is the home of righteousness. What a wonderful plan, far bigger than what we would ever imagine. When we dip into God's word, we begin to see this story unfold and the thrill and joy that we are part of it. Therefore, it is incumbent upon us to have the same attitude to all of this that the Apostle Paul had recorded in Philippians 3 and verse 14. Paul says, I press toward the goal for the prize. Now, we've had the presentation to our football academy, and those young footballers today are dreaming about holding up the World Cup or some championship cup. In fact, one young man did it for the most improved player in our academy. And that's a goal and a prize that people are dreaming about. Now, Paul says, yes. I'm sure he wasn't against those things, but he said there's another goal in mind, another prize in mind that is far more glorious, more permanent, and more enriching, and more rewarding, and more satisfying, and more fulfilling. The goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ. To rise up and lay hold of everything that God had in his mind when he laid hold of you. What is that? What is his principal purpose? Of course it is to reveal himself to you so you get to know him and to show himself to you so that your life becomes like him, to know him, to love him, to become like him and then display him and show him to the world. So possessing your inheritance is linked to fulfilling your calling. Every one of us, we have a life calling and it's our inheritance that brings great Reward All over the Bible, the Bible writers speak about this. For example, Paul speaks about it more clearly when he comes almost to the end of his life. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 to 8. Paul sees the finishing line and he's able to say, I have fought the good fight. The good fight. There's a battle. There's a struggle. There's training. There's disciplining. And in any kind of sports training, there are times when you think, I can't take it anymore. What am I, what am I doing here? Then you remember your plan, your purpose. I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. As he sees the finishing line, he says, finally, this is it. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, and not to me only, but to also to all who have loved his appearing. There was no thought in Paul's mind of finishing 
before the finishing line. He was going to go right on to the blessed end. And there's a tragedy that we see everywhere in life, the tragedy of an unfinished work or of an unpossessed inheritance. When we think about unfinished work, the first thing that came to my mind was Schubert's Unfinished Symphony. Many people have heard about that Schubert's Symphony Number no. 8, known as the Unfinished Symphony, because he left behind only two movements, and as we all know, a symphony needs three. Part one, part two, and part three is the finish. It's the climax. It's the conclusion. He finished two-thirds of the way through. There was some scherzo that he wrote, and it was put to piano, but only two pages were annotated and orchestrated. And the question always is asked, why didn't he finish it? Why not? Well, some people say, well, his uh, final movement was developed into another piece of music and he used it elsewhere. And he didn't finish the work. Other people say, well, he, he was a little bit timid about it because he was breaking some classical rules of composition, mainly about the, the triple meter timing. And maybe he got cold feet and said, this work's not going to be accepted. And maybe he was distracted that way. Others have speculated that he couldn't work because he was sick. He actually had an illness that he gained through some kind of ungodly means or other in this adult audience. We can all imagine what. And others say he was distracted by another inspiration. Inspiration for his wanderer fantasy. And he wandered from his first purpose and wandered into another purpose. And a lot of people are like that, always starting things and never finishing things. And it's not a good thing. I thank God that Jesus finishes his work. Amen. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. A wonderful passage because it talks not just about Jesus finishing his work. It talks about the attitude he had in pursuing it right to the blessed end. What was his goal? What was his motive? What was his real purpose in pursuing God's call upon his life. And also it shows how we are brought up into that same purpose and how the one who is the author of our faith is also the one who is the finisher of our faith. I thank God he finishes what he starts. Hebrews 12 verses 1 and 2. Let's read it. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. So we see some impediments, don't we? The weights, sin, the snares that we have to overcome and run the race with endurance. In other words, there's an endurance issue. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus. Another big clue. If you're going to get to the blessed end, you've got to keep your eyes on Jesus. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. He's not only the author, but he's the finisher. Thank God we're going to make it. Jesus is our author and finisher, the finisher of our faith. Now, here's his motivation. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Nobody can imagine what it meant for Jesus to endure the cross. For it was not just a physical suffering. There was intense emotional suffering. And when we start to calculate that he was also bearing the sins of the world, there was a, is a spiritual dimension to the suffering of Jesus and that separation from the Father that we could never possibly imagine. And it must have been awful for him. But he endured the cross. Why? Because there was a joy set before him. He despised the shame. Why? Because there was a joy set before him. And it says he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And if we put other scriptures together, henceforth now expecting his enemies to be made a footstool. It was a successful operation. Jesus did it. He succeeded. And now he is reaping the rewards of his suffering. And by the way, chief of that is bringing glory to the Father by laying hold of your life 
and laying hold of my life and saying, come on, be part of my plan. Be part of my purpose. Live for the call of God upon your life. So when the Israelites are called to possess the land, that points to you and me. Today in 2015, God's call upon our lives to possess our inheritance and to lay hold of everything that God had in his mind when he laid hold of us. Nobody, as I say, likes anything unfinished. David Cameron's and the Conservative Party shock victory at the polls over the weekend. I say shock, not to make any comment about the political situation, but just the fact that it was so unpredictable. David Cameron's theme throughout the uh, Conservative Party campaign was, let us finish the job, let us finish the job, let us finish the job. And uh, whatever the rights or wrongs about the political economic policy that he wanted to see through to completion, that, no comment about that, but maybe something resonated in the hearts of people thinking, yes, something started, we must finish. Even on Mastermind, I've started, so I'll finish <laughs> the question. We, we don't like anything unfinished. There's something in our human personality that wants to see through to a satisfying conclusion if we have a plan or a project. I know that in my own ministry over these years, that there are ministry objectives which are yet unfulfilled. And I can't guarantee that I will be given to fulfill everything that has been in my heart because God is the God of the generations and, and you make a contribution and others come and take, take it further and so on. But I'm sure there are certain things in your life, whether they are ministry related, personally related, or whether they're to do with your, 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 your job or something, or an act of service of ministry, there's something that God wants you to do, and either you haven't begun it yet, or you haven't fulfilled it yet. Today's message is about laying hold of what God has called you to do, and seeing it through to a glorious conclusion. An unfinished task, nobody likes that. An unclaimed inheritance. Now there's a tragedy. Every year, millions of people die without making a will. Millions of people. And you think the one provision to, to pr provide for one thing that is certain in your life, how, how many people die without a will? It causes all, all kinds of problems, especially when the money goes to the a treasury and, and, and people are struggling to try and find some heirs and there are whole industries based on air hunters who go and find uh, if there are any missing relatives and uh, sit down and, and, and have a kind of speech which I think is a bit like this. Good morning, I represent such and such a company and I, I don't, I've got some uh, good news and some bad news. I've got to tell you the bad news first. Your great uncle, sister's car, car, uh, aunt's cousin's nephew whom you never knew existed, is dead. And the person goes, oh, what? I, oh, how sad, how sad. And then they say, right, okay, now, of course, the good news is, is that you're the only living relative and it's left you 250,000 pounds. Oh, how, oh, how, 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 oh. The next question is, um, uh, and what must I do now? <laughs> do you know that currently, right up to this minute, there are 14,163 unclaimed estates in the UK. Maybe some of you here. <laughs> if you go and search the list, may find that you have an unknown relative who is a multi, multi-millionaire. And uh, at such a time as this, I would say, remember your, in your will, Kensington Temple. <laughs> and remember, in your inheritance, Kensington Temple. <laughs> but the tragedy is, right now, there are billions of pounds in unclaimed estates. I, th I think that's tragic and frustrating that some people may be living in poverty, not knowing 
that they have a wealthy inheritance if they just knew about it and did what was necessary to claim it. But even more tragic than that would be the idea of arriving at your destination and seeing the inheritance that could have been yours if only you had raised yourself up and applied yourself here on this earth to lay hold of everything that God had in his mind when he laid hold of you. And there's another tragedy here, really. It's very sad. But it is often the case, what you don't conquer now will conquer you later. And that's exactly what was happening in Canaan. In the first instance, Joshua, as their great visionary apostolic leader for about five years, led them personally at the head of the army and faced a coalition of kings in Canaan in the south and another coalition of kings in the north and he defeated them, began to allot the land, gave the land rest. In fact, not one of God's promises had failed. The whole of the land had been handed over and they were occupying the land, but they had not all of them risen to lay hold of their little piece of the land. And one of these surely was Issachar. And he is a very, very poignant example what I'm talking about. Issachar, it was one of the tribes and Moses, as he was about to hand over the task of taking the people into the land, prophesied over the tribes of Israel and spoke about some of the things that were going to happen. And in this prophecy, he highlights one tribe, Issachar, which is typical of what happens when you don't rise up and conquer, you become subject to those who should have conquered. And it's very similar in our nation today. When we are complaining about all the land that yet to be possessed and how the oppression is coming back and, and the church of Jesus Christ in this nation is under more pressure than ever before, perhaps it's because we didn't rise up and take possession of our inheritance when we had the chance to. And now it's going to be harder, but we are going to do it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's read this prophecy taken from the New Living Translation, Genesis 49, verses 14 to 15. Issachar is a sturdy donkey. Well, I don't know. Is that a compliment or not? If somebody called me a donkey, I would think they were not really passing me a compliment. But I reckon in these days it was a kind of compliment. Be a bit like saying, you've got a, a four-wheel drive Ford utility in your back garden. Something that may not be very glamorous, but it's very useful, strong, and sturdy. Issachar is a sturdy donkey. But as we zoom in, what is this donkey doing? Resting between two saddle packs. Resting between two saddle packs. There's the donkey resting. One side is a burden. Another side is a burden. Lying between two burdens. And that, I think, was exactly what was going on in the mind of many of these Israelite tribes. They were saying, you know, it's a burden for us to have to rise up and give ourselves to the task of taking the fortified cities and driving out the giants. We're not up for that. And on the other side, there was another burden waiting. This was the burden of the inhabitants of Canaan. Because the Canaanites were under threat. And you start to get pally with the Canaanites, they're not going to be neutral. They're going to say, okay, if you're not going to rise up and take the burden of the Lord, we will give you a burden of our own. So that's what it says. When he sees how good the countryside is and how pleasant the land. This is wonderful. Joshua has given us rest. I like that word, rest. Many people who hear the grace word rest, and they think, oh, that means I do nothing if I don't feel like it. I'm on a summer holiday. Forget enlisting in the war. I'm not, I'm not into that. I'm a civilian. I'm just going to coast. And you think that you are going to benefit from that. You think that no burden is going to come upon you. I like the words from Bob Dylan's album, which came out many years ago during his evangelical Christian phase, 
when he said one of the songs, it may be the devil, it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. That donkey ain't going to escape service, either the service of God or the service of Canaan. And that's exactly what happened. It says, he will bend his shoulder to the, lo lo to the load and submit himself to hard labor. I'm trying to be encouraging this morning, but let me just say, sitting where you sit and sit alongside you as one of you, and say just briefly, but truthfully, life is hard. Yes? And if you say, I'm going to live all out and out for Jesus, guess what? Life just gets harder. It's much easier to sit back. But you're not going to benefit from that. You're not going to come out on top there. Because as you let those influences around you influence you, you're going to be under even harder labor than you ever thought. That's just a plain fact of life in the New Living uh, Translation of the Bible. In, the, in its study version, there's a commentary on this, and it says, Israel's ensuing unfaithfulness delayed the settlement process by several centuries. They could have driven them out in, Joshua, in the Joshua generation, but they didn't. And they came back to bite them again and again and again, even till the time of David, for the, for the Goliath that David fought was the son of the giants of Anak, which should have been driven out generations before, several centuries. Instead of driving out the remaining Canaanites, Israel absorbed them. They say, we can absorb them into our culture. No, 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 no. The only way to enter the culture of God is to be born again and to commit your life to Christ. When the salt loses its saltiness, of what value is it? And as a result of that, God's people were brought even greater temptations and Joshua knew it and warned about it. So he says, let us rise up and finish the work that God has given us to do. Thank God, as I said, Jesus leaves nothing unfinished. He says in John 17, I've glorified you on the earth. I've finished the work you gave me to do. Paul says in Philippians 1 verse 6 that he was very confident of this very thing, that he, that is Jesus, who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ. We have within us, we are ahead of the game, we have the wind in our sails, God is clearing the way, we can press through, we can rise up, and we can win what God has called us to do. That's the tragedy of unfinished work. But there's also another tragedy. There's the tragedy of uncommanded work. Because you're fighting for the wrong thing. And in fact, in fact I'm almost tempted to call this a comedy. Because it is absolutely ridiculous that the thought that we can come up with a better plan than God. Just imagine being in a crazy kind of way. Here we are. We are the one exception to the pre-existence of the planet. We're the one exception and we sit with God, and, and God says, I'm going to create the universe. Oh, really? Well, I had another plan. Oh, I'm going to send my son in the world. To, I've got another plan. The problem is we do have other plans. The Bible says there is a way that seems right unto a man, but the ends thereof are the ways of death. The Bible says God's thoughts are not our thoughts, God's ways are not our ways, as high as the heavens are above the earth. That's how high and more developed and elevated and perfect are God's plans by comparison with our plans. There is nothing you could ever sit around and dream about becoming or doing, achieving, fulfilling or having on this planet that in any way is worth comparing with the glorious plan God has for you. Now I know it's a, tr a question of trust because you have to trust God that he knows best. And it's not an easy life. Paul talked about running a race. It wasn't so long ago some ran the London Marathon. You see them at the end? Wow. I wonder how many wish they never began. 
or a fight. Of course, there are negative circumstances for us to overcome. If you're going to rise up and conquer something, you've got to have a battle. We have to rise up in the spirit of faith and lay hold of what God has for us. And so we've got to say, okay, Lord, let's begin with this. My plan, talk to him about it if you wish, but make sure he's got a red pencil. Uh, you know, you realize he's got a red pencil and say, nope, that's ridiculous. That's ri- I've got a better plan than that. Trust him for his plan for your life. When you know that that plan is to shape Christ in you, so his glory is seen in you, there is nothing worth sacrificing. That is certainly not worth sacrificing for anything that we think is a better plan that usually is all about me and not about him. So, what is that plan? Of course it is to do the work of Christ. He's called us. Look at this, Ephesians 4 verse 7. It says, but to each... One of us. Grace was given. Now this is not talking here about saving grace. He's dealt with that in chapter 2. He's talking about perfecting grace, persevering grace, serving grace. God has called us by his grace to serve him in a special way. And this grace is an enabling grace to live out our life according to God's plan to successfully lay hold of everything that God had in his mind when he called us in the first place. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Now it's a plain fact. Each of us is called and enabled and given a gift, the gift of his plan and the ability to pursue it as we are faithful to the Lord. But not every one of us has the same measure. And it's no good. For example, let's just give you one example. Went to the dentist recently, had to do some work, and they had x-ray, and they looked at my sinuses. Uh, And they wow. You know how dentists and medical people get? They get excited about the strangest things. Wow, look at those sinal cavities. How they're fine. Come and look at this. Come. Wow. (laughs) And I, in my mind, I thought, yes, I know I've got wonderful sinus uh, cavities, that, that is, the sinus cavities, that is why I sing so well. <laughs> but as my mouth was in different positions, I couldn't give them a rendition to demonstrate it. And so, there are peculiarities. In fact, is I don't sing very well. And what if, if I had this dream of becoming solo singer at Royal Opera House? I would be on a losing wicket. In fact, you wouldn't even be able to pay people to come and listen. I did make Covent Garden, but for other reasons, other gifts. Each one of us has given a measure according to Christ's gift. I won't go into it today, we'll come back to this, but there are five ways that Christ has gifted us as individuals. In one or more of the combinations above, that's the apostolic calling, the prophetic calling, evangelistic calling, pastoral calling, and teaching calling. You say, yes, 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 we know about that. That's church life. Oh, he never said this just happens in church life. In fact, that major calling is broadly speaking, some are able to combine it very well, but normally people are called to minister for Christ either based in the meeting place Ministry to believers, teaching and preaching to the body of Christ and within the scope of church ministry. But there is also another calling. And in fact, I think it is the greater calling in many ways. It's the calling that most of you have and we celebrate it, we rejoice in it and we encourage it and we as the ministers of the church who are engaged full time consider it's our primary responsibility to equip you and release you into it. That is ministry in the marketplace. Hallelujah. You are called to be apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers in the marketplace and not only have we 
talk, are talking about your calling, but we have given you a structure and a strategy to pursue it. That's the cell vision, not just to gather in holy huddles in the church building in between services on a Sunday, but to get out there and to begin to win people to Christ and demonstrate that Jesus Christ is alive and to say, I'm part of a bigger story. It is a bigger story than what's happening in my life, a bigger story right now than what's happening in Britain, although what's happening in Britain is a big story. It is a bigger story than anything that any part of history will be able to explain. It is the story of the whole of history. God is getting glory to his name by building a people of faith and relationship with him. Amen and amen. That is our calling. Well, we've talked about two tragedies. The tragedy of an unfinished task, an unclaimed inheritance. We've talked about the tragedy of pursuing your own dream and vision and missing God. But after these two tragedies, I thought you're ready for an adventure. There's an adventure story. What a genre of literature, even music, drama, the arts, film. Adventure stories. This is the romantic adventure hero story of you and I laying hold of God and accomplishing his mission no matter what the odds are stacked against us. Wow, that's amazing. Next time you uh, deign to have, give yourself a bit of a break uh, and switch on a, a decent movie, an adventure movie, and you watch the hero, just put yourself there and say, right, I'm a hero. Of course, Jesus is the big, 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 big hero. I've got a tiny bit part spear carrying in the crowd by comparison to Jesus, but I'm part of the plot. I'm involved in this, and I'm involved in a great plan, a plan bigger than my life, a plan bigger than anything anybody can imagine with human imagination. And I want to be part of that satisfaction that comes. I want to experience that satisfaction that comes when God's purpose for my life and all his purposes are fulfilled. Amen and amen. Some little tips on the way. Remember this, if you haven't discovered it already. It gets worse before it gets better. Just a little tip, just a little clue. It's not without conflict. It's not walking from glory to glory as if there were no um, triumph to triumph, as if there were no battles. You can't be triumphant if there's no resistance against what you're seeking to achieve for God. There are a few do's and don'ts, and we'll come back to some of this later, but first of all, just to give you a little bit of a full picture today, don't leave it to others. Okay, what's this? Joshua, there you are, you are God's anointed man. You were with Moses from the beginning. You're faithful. God, Moses laid his hands on you. You received the spirit and you are our leader. Get on and do it and we'll just, we'll just follow behind you. There's a time when Joshua said, stop looking at me. The very verses that I read began with, Joshua was old and well advanced in years. In other words, your time's nearly up, mate. So, uh, in the same way, you don't look just to people to do it for you, whether they're your leaders your cell leaders, or whether they're your best friends, there is something that you can do for Jesus that only you can do for Jesus. So Pentecostal hymn used to say, there's a work for Jesus none but, none but you can do. You've got to rise up. And you don't go it alone. Only you can do it, but you don't go it alone. We're part of a community. The people of Israel were the people of Israel. They said, come, let's, let's go this way. And we'll, I'll help you in your battle. You help me in my battle. The cell vision, the cell ministry is all about doing it together. Most of all, don't settle for half measures. Don't sit in the middle of the saddle packs and just say, here's a nice place to rest. Thank you, Jesus, for your grace. Rise up and take what's yours. There remains very much land yet to be possessed. What is it in your life right now? Don't put you off your Sunday dinner. Don't want to do that, but even if you thought those DIY jobs back at home, or projects at work, or aspirations that God put in your spirit to be part of the ministry, 
that Jesus has for you in the marketplace. We've seen a great example of it today. Eddie and the team, great examples of people who are saying it's not just about telling people good news, it's about being good news. Every one of those young people beaming from ear to ear know that the church of Jesus Christ is good news to them, not just preacher's good news. So God has assigned an inheritance for you. It's part of his big plan. He promises to go before you and open the way. But you must rise up and take possession of it. Find the plan and run with it right to the finish line. Let's pray. Before I close today, it occurs to me that I'm talking to people saying, come on, rise up and take God's plan for your life. Possess your Canaan. Possess that bit of Canaan that is yours. But you ain't even out of Egypt yet, some of you. You've got to get out of Egypt before you can get into Canaan. You've got to get out of your sin before you can step into your inheritance. You have to receive Christ as Savior and Lord before you can even begin to learn what his plan for your life is. You can't run this race with the burden of sin. You need to be born again. Jesus said you can't even see the kingdom of heaven unless you're born again. And here's your opportunity today to say today is day one. As I step into God's plan in my life, the most important decision you could ever make is not who to vote for in the general election, though I hope you all participated Biggest decision is not who you shall marry in life, though that's a very important decision. The biggest decision is where am I going to spend eternity? Am I going to escape the jaws of Egypt that I can begin to really live in the fulfillment of God's plan for my life? And all begins at the cross. Just like I said, the blood of Jesus. The Bible says, God said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. There is a way to escape. The inevitable, righteous, and just judgment of God on lives who've rejected him. It's a fact, it's unpalatable, but it's true, and it's the beginning of good news. And the good news is this. The blood of Jesus washes and cleanses from every sin. How do I enter this? very simple. The Bible says, by faith and faith alone. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to dress your life up. You don't have to... Th- Make big promises. The only thing is this, is to say, Jesus, I recognize you as my Savior. And by faith, I take the blood of your sacrifice, the stuff that you achieved for me, and I make it my own by faith and receive you as my Lord and as my Savior. By faith and faith alone. And then, then, one day at a time, You live out the rest of your life. There are people here, I believe, who are ready to make that decision. So let's pray. Here's how we're going to do it. I'm going to pray. And I want you, it'll be a prayer for you. I want you to pray it in your heart or out loud, wherever you wish. But it's a a prayer to invite people to say, Jesus, I need you and I receive you today. Here's the prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, I come to you now. And I confess that I'm still in the bondage of Egypt. Egypt. I'm still under the condemnation of my sins because I've never applied the blood to my life. I've never taken Jesus as my Savior. But today, I make that choice deliberately, knowingly, consciously, seriously. Jesus, I want you in my life so that all the benefits of the cross come to me today. I accept that you are Lord who died for my sins and I put my trust in you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Stay where you are. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Before I dismiss you and somebody comes to close the service, I want to give you something. If you've made that decision, we have people here who are ready to come and hand you some helpful literature to take you forward. So, consolidators, please listen to my words and follow what I'm asking and not just the normal way of doing it. And Here it is. I'm going to ask you in a moment to lift your hand, and as soon as you lift your hand, somebody will come and stand with you, and you can put your hand down, and then we're linked up with them just to help you straight after the service to take you further in this. Okay, every Christian praying now. If you made that decision 
to follow Christ and you want to follow Christ as your first time decision, I want you to lift your hand and hold it up very boldly and somebody will come and stand with you. Who's going to be the first today to acknowledge publicly, I need Jesus in my life. Lift your hands. Help me on the platform in case I'm missing somebody. Lift your hand high. You're saying yes to Jesus today. Downstairs in the low hall overflow behind me, also online. If you're saying yes to Jesus, lift your hand high, high so I can see it. Right now, I don't see any hands lifted. Are you sure that you don't need Jesus today? There's somebody up there. Thank you. God bless you. Are you sure you don't need Jesus today? Don't put it off. God has brought you to a place where you can make a decision by his grace and with his help right now. So find the time to ask him before I pray. Anybody else wants to say yes to Jesus today? Let me see. Thank you there. Father, I thank you in Jesus' name for the power of your gospel to change a life, to change a heart, to take us on the wrong path and set us on the path of fruitfulness and ultimately receive us into your heavenly kingdom. We thank you for these things. And for all of us today, we say, Jesus, we want to rise up to go with the plan for our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Give Jesus a big praise. God bless you.